Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Alison Watts from the Southern Cross Postgraduate Association. A big warm welcome to all of you. We've got something like 90 people uh, registered, uh, which is pretty amazing. So welcome. Uh, we're here for qualitative research methods with Dr. Megan Lee. So just a few th quick little things before we get hand over to Megan. I've put some uh, messages in the chat box for everyone to become a member of the association. It's free and it only takes a couple of minutes. And this recording will go to the SCPA YouTube channel. And if you go to that link in the chat box, you'll see all the other recordings there as well. But it'll take me a day or three to get that recording out. So um, just a quick uh, kind of update on other workshops that are coming up soon is um, next week we've got Dr. Robert Lingard. He's going to do um, in vivo. Uh, so keep an eye out for that notice for your student emails. And then Thursday, the 21st of March, we've got Megan Lee back to do a workshop on Qualtrics. Okay, that'll do it for me. <laughs> Over to you, Megan. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Megan Lee. I am a senior teaching fellow at Bond University at the moment, and I'm also a PhD alumni of Southern Cross University. So I finished my PhD in nutritional psychiatry in June of 2022, and I was also a, a member of the Southern Cross Postgraduate Association for the entirety of my PhD. It was one of the best things that I have uh, ever done. Um, not to bore you with the details, but I had a little bit of a tumultuous uh, relationship with my supervisors and had a little bit of uh, some issues while I was uh, doing my PhD. And the support that I got from the Southern Cross Postgraduate Association was what kept me going, basically. I don't think I would have finished my PhD if it wasn't for the people and the um, help and support that I got from the SCPA. Um, so I would highly, highly recommend joining, um, not just for that type of support, but all the other type of support that you get, lots of networking opportunities, the Praxis Conference, all of those things are just, were so vital in the success that I achieved when I finished my degree. I really don't think it was actually about the thesis that I produced, but more along the the lines of the people that I met and um, still have relationships with now. So I 100% suggest clicking on that link. It's in the chat box. Join the SCPA. It'll be the best thing that you that you do in your in your higher degree research experience. Um, so, and I always talk about that when I start my workshops because um, I really believe in um, the SCPA and what they do. And they're external to the university, which is an amazing thing. So they're not attached to the university. So if something does happen, they can go in and advocate for you and, and be your support. And yeah, anyway, so a little bit of background on what I do. So I am a psychology graduate. Um, and when I finished my PhD, I started a role in the School of Psychology at Bond. I mainly have expertise in research methods and statistics. And I'm a bit of a unicorn in the fact that I know both qualitative and quantitative data analysis and research methods. So I like, I'm a bit of a pragmatist. I really believe in mixed methods research. I don't believe that you can get the full picture from uh, sorting data and looking at numbers, but I also don't think you can get the whole picture from asking people about their experiences. I believe that you have to merge the two um, types of data to get the full experience or the full picture of, of what's happening with um, phenomenon. So that is why I'm, I am here today to teach you about qualitative research methods. Now, today's workshop will be all about the different methods, the types of methods and the um, data collection and a little bit of the analysis, but I also teach a qualitative data analysis workshop, which we don't, I haven't done for the SCPA yet. But if at the end of this 
a workshop, you think that that would be beneficial for you, maybe we can talk to Alison about doing a whole data analysis workshop, which is basically, I touch on in the last two slides of this workshop, the six stages of thematic, reflexive thematic analysis, which is the most common way of analysing data. But I can do a whole workshop doing a deep dive into that and in, into content analysis as well, if you feel that that might be beneficial. Anyway, let's go. There are all my socials if you want to follow me. I do lots of fun stuff on food and mental health as well as uh, research methods and other research stuff. So what will we cover today? We will cover the differences between quantitative and qualitative uh, research methods and why qualitative research is becoming very important. It's kind of like the little sister to quant and a lot of quantitative uh, researchers don't really see a lot of benefit in qualitative and I'm here to show you that it's definitely needed and definitely a part mm -hmm. of what we need to do in all research. Um, we're going to do a deep dive into the different methodologies. So what are the differences between interviews, focus groups and ethnography or ethnographic studies? We'll also look at some really cool stuff that is happening in the world in social media content analysis, which is um, really fun. You can do newspapers, you can do social media, things like that. We'll also be looking at the uh, types of ways of collecting data and the research ethics that are surrounding the differences between qualitative data collection and quantitative data collection, because it's very, it's very different because confidentiality sometimes isn't easy because particularly in things like focus groups, where everyone's telling everybody their confidential information, you don't really have control of over confidentiality and anonymity after the fact. Um, and then, as I said in the last two slides, we'll Andrew? touch on that. You're most okay. Sorry. We'll touch on that most common data analysis strategy for uh, qualitative data analysis, which is reflexive thematic analysis, and a couple of the other analyses that are used for qualitative data. So you know a little bit about me. Let's get to know each other. Now, I know there's 30 of us in the workshop today, so we might not all get a chance to speak on the microphone about who we are one by one, otherwise that'll take us the full hour. But if you want to type into the chat box, um, who, who you are, we know your names because your names are on the chat, but uh, what degree you're doing, are you a PhD student, are you a master's student, are you a honours student, are you an undergrad, um, have you conducted qualitative research before, um, ha if you have, uh, what type of research was it, if you haven't, have you ever considered doing qualitative research? Who is doing qualitative research in their thesis at the moment? Who has been asked to do qualitative research? And what promoted you to come to this workshop today? And I'll read out some of the answers. So just tell me what you know about qual, what you don't know about qual, and what your interests are in why we're here today to learning about qualitative research. Banerjan, I'm conducting a PhD in flood predi prediction using deep learning techniques for Northern Rivers region. He starts his PhD, he started his PhD in November of 2023. Dorian, Masters in Business Law, based in Griffith, never done very much research. No, I haven't done qualitative research before, that's why I'm here, so I can learn about it. Okay. So maybe hands up who has done qualitative research before. If you use the hands up function down the bottom of the chat. Anthony, Anastasia. Anthony's a PhD stu student doing a mental health topic and he's done qualitative research before and his thesis also involves qualitative research. Do you want to elaborate, Anthony, on what uh, qualitative research you are going to be using in your thesis? Yeah, thanks, Megan. Um, I'm a bit 
conscious that it might be a little bit of wishy washy. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm describing it as um, a descriptive, qualitative descriptive study. Sure. And I was toying up with the idea of whether I call it a qualitative exploratory study. Um, but it's not, it's not grounded theory or anything more kind of structured than that. Um, I was under the belief that qualitative research, like that, was that's a valid kind of encompassing methodology. But their mind bodies around the experiences of mental health consumers on a particular model of care. And I'm also doing, um, I'm doing focus groups with consumers, with nurses, and then another group of people in the community. So that's um, that's kind of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, because I wanted to explore their experiences. That doesn't sound wishy-washy at all. That sounds like a really good topic and a really good research aim. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. What about you, Anastasia? What are you doing? Do you want to share? Oh, I've just popped in the chat. Um, Sorry, I'm a PhD student and I'm looking at um, pain and cystic fibrosis. So we've actually um, have a survey that's just finished. And I've got both quantitative and qualitative mm -hmm. data um, back in the survey. Cool. Oh, so your qualitative data are open-ended questions in your survey. Yeah, yeah. So it's been really interesting to explore their experiences around pain and then also use the validated tools to measure their pain, like frequency, locations, that sort of thing. I love that. I love when surveys have their quantitative Likert scale questions and then they're backed by an open-ended response box. It's like my favourite thing. Yeah, it's been really interesting. It's awesome. One of the best surveys that we ever did for data, we here at Southern Cross, uh, a group of collaborators and I surveyed 700 academics across Australia and asked them about their experiences with non-constructive student feedback narratives from their from the student feedback surveys that we get and we asked them quantitative questions and the open box asking them to tell us some of the things that the students said in the student feedback and produced one of the best papers on some of the shocking things that um, academics in Australia get said to them in these surveys just amazing and from having a quantitative our quantitative data but also the open-ended boxes we ended up getting six papers out of that one survey because we looked at the student the non-constructive student comments and we looked at the impacts on mental health in the academics and we looked at the impacts on teaching and learning and all these topics just kind of came out of these qualitative responses it was a very very cool Thank you, Anastasia. Everyone's sharing. This is great stuff. Massim, my last qualitative research paper on mental health published in Frontiers in Public Health. Wow, the first author. Nice, Massim. Oh, look at these are all great. Yeah, wow. Okay, cool. Bridget, I'm a master's by research transfer to PhD. Excellent. Background in speech pathology. Topic on voice and communication challenges and support needs for autistic, trans and gender diverse individuals, mixed methods. That's an amazing topic to explore with both methods. Excellent. David Shaw, researching the educational experiences of children with incarcerated parents using qual semi-structured interviews. Did... Med using qual, I'm using critical realism. Excellent. Shari Thompson from Bond. Nice to see you again. After Shari graduated from Bond, I moved to Darwin with my partner and start my honours year. Thesis projects have not been released yet, but surprisingly two of the three of my preferences were qualitative. Nice. Very good to see you again. Cool. Thank you everyone for sharing. We have a little bit of a mixed bag of um, participants who either haven't had any experience with qualitative research methods before to are dabbling with the theories and doing some things in qualitative all the way up to people who have published qualitative research. So this is going to be a really good um 
level of different experiences. And I've got a lot of questions in this workshop um, asking you to be involved. So please stay on the chat box and answer my questions as we go along. Um, try to keep it interactive and fun, basically. So let's get to it then, shall we? Right. So quantitative versus qualitative research methods. So quantitative research uses data containing numbers to count, examine, and interpret relationships, associations, causality, and differences between groups. So we all kind of know that. We've looked at quantitative data before. It's all about numbers and quantifying associations and relationships and things like that. Qualitative research is, is very different in that it uses words to explore, observe, and interpret individual experiences. And these are just the definitions of these two. When you dive deeper into the differences, it's quite amazing how uh, far apart they are. And I always use the um, the example that you can have your quantitative and qualitative researchers at a party and all of the quant researchers will sit on one side and all the qual researchers will sit on the other side and they don't usually mingle because they see things in such a different way. Qualitative research is subjective, very subjective. It uses a lot of researcher degrees of freedom, which means that we have a lot of control over what comes out of the data. But at the same time, it can be quite interesting because you have to maintain and reflect on your own subjectivity and your own belief systems. And we'll get to that in a, in a moment. It's a very different method and it's exploratory whereas quantitative research is usually confirmatory. So it's confirming a belief or a hypothesis that we make, whereas qualitative research is all about exploring things. And we, we don't usually start with a idea of what we're going to find. We really want the data to come from the individuals that we talk to or that we're observing. And it's also very open-ended rather than closed. So... Quantitative research, and we all kind of know this, it starts, particularly that research process, starts with a theory. And then we hypothesize about what we believe will happen. We then collect our data and observe what happens in the data, which then confirms our theory and our hypotheses of what is going to happen. Whereas qualitative research is kind of flipped the other way. It's inductive thinking. We want to observe patterns in, in nature or patterns in human behavior. And we then use this to hypothesize about why that is. And then we build theories, which is why I believe that qualitative research should always be the first step in most research projects. And what I mean by that is if you're going to build a survey that asks questions, quantitative questions to a group of people, to build that survey, you should go and talk to the people first and find out what they believe, their opinions, their experiences to build that survey. So qualitative research really is the beginning of the exploration of a topic particularly if you've got a topic that has never been explored before and you need to build some form of scale that hasn't ever been built or a survey that has never been done before. So qualitative research should always be kind of that first process. Right. So in quantitative research, re the research process is deductive. We measure objective facts, we focus on variables, and there's always this firewall between the researcher and the and the process and the analysis and then the outcomes. And we are told and again and again that we should remove all of our biases and remove ourselves from the data. So much so that back before the last changes in the APA 7 um, writing format, we were told never to write I, we, me into a scientific paper and to remove the researcher completely from the process. 
Whereas qualitative research it, in its inductiveness, it documents social realities. Meaning is constructed between the researcher and the participants. It focuses in on rich lived experience. And the researcher is a part of the process. And instead of removing the researcher from the process and the researcher's biases and beliefs and values and judgments, it's all part of the analysis. It's all part of the exploration. It's all part of the process. But it's very, very important in qualitative research that the researcher constantly reflects on what they bring to the project, what values, beliefs, judgment systems, what morals and opinions do you bring to the process? And while you are collecting data and engaging with participants and analysing data and building codes and themes, which we'll get into later, you must always be checking in on those values and beliefs that you have and how the participants are making you feel and how you are impacting the participants and how they are impacting the way that you are analysing the data, which is really cool. And I actually have a belief, and we'll get into reflexive journals in a second. We're going to have an activity where we do a reflexive journal together I truly believe that all researchers, quantitative or qualitative, should do reflexive journaling throughout their research process, despite what method that they use. And I'll see if you agree with me once we do the reflexive journal. Right. So quantitative data is all about statistical analysis of numbers. It's highly structured. There's a research process, particularly in the psychology field. We've got this whole scientific method, this scientist practitioner model that we are told to use. It's very particular. It's very specific. We're separated from the data. And the benefit of this process is that we can measure things in the world and generalize from small samples to the general population, because that's what statistical analysis can do. Now, a lot of people believe and incorrectly believe that statistical analysis isn't subjective. It's it's down the line. Once you find your, your result, it's known. This is what it is. It's either significant or it's not significant. But when you kind of delve into quantitative statistical analysis, you will find that it is also quite subjective. And the researcher, from the very time that they create their research method and their research design and collect their data and analyze their data, they're making decisions all the way through that make that statistical analysis and the result at the end quite subjective. Even the whole significance being less than 0.05 and non-significance being over 0.05 is a subjective it's a subjective rule. There is not much difference between a p-value of 0.051 and a p-value of 0.049 when one is significant and one is not. My students really dislike that when I teach them that in the statistical analysis classes. So qualitative analysis is more thematic. It's loosely structured. It's holistic. It's intimate. You move away from the data. You move close to the data. It's it's an enjoy It should be an enjoyable process. But generalisation to the population is a little bit more tricky, particularly with smaller sample sizes. That's where I believe you need to mix the methods so you can generalise to the population with your quant data and you can delve into rich lived experience and people's individualised differences with the qualitative data. Right, any questions about the differences between quant and qual before we move into the strengths of qualitative research? No? Okay. Feel free to put hands up or put something in the chat, questions in the chat at any time. I'm happy to answer. So the strengths of qualitative research is that we explore in-depth feelings, motivations, opinions, experiences, perceptions, understanding, and meaning. And... When you become a qualitative researcher or a mixed methods researcher, it's really important 
to use these terminologies and try to start moving away from quantitative words like relationships and associations and differences. They're quantitative words. Qualitative words are like experiences and perceptions and opinions and beliefs about what our participants are experiencing. We can look into real life situations that are unable to be measured in the laboratory or using a survey. And the whole reason that I started being interested in qualitative research was back in my honours year where I was looking at body image in the postpartum. I did a survey of mums and I asked them all these questions in my survey on Likert scales. And then when I was writing up my paper, I realised that two mums could answer the one question the same way but have completely different reasons for answering it that way. And I just had this longing to go and talk to the mums, sit down with cake and coffee, have the kids running around in the room all together and have a conversation about how they felt about their bodies, how they felt about eating and how things had changed since pre-pregnancy. Now, we've done that now. We did this last year with my honours students and we got such an amazing um, raft of information from these mums that we would never have gotten from those um, survey questions. But qualitative research doesn't need to be um, either or. It can complement quantitative analysis, as Anastasia showed, with uh, surveys with open-ended and closed-ended questions. So you can use them both in the same research project. But, and this is a, my one of my favourite memes about qualitative research, because a lot of students who are afraid of statistical analyses will nominate my projects at, in honours at Bond because I do quite a bit of qualitative research and they think that they're going to get away with not having to do statistical analysis and that it's going to be easy. However, the analyses of qualitative research is actually a lot more time consuming and it can be harder because you have to completely unlearn all of the things that you learn in quantitative analysis through your degree and you need to learn how to look deeper into the meaning behind what people say in the interviews rather than just that surface level of what they did say. Um, qualitative research is quite difficult to uh, show generalizability to the larger population because you're always speaking to specific people in specific populations. Um, that body image in the postpartum stuff that we're doing, the focus groups, they're all Australian mums. And usually the same thing, that people who do, who say yes to recruiting for a this type of research will be usually higher socioeconomic usually white, usually um, pretty well off, educated. So you really kind of get a bit of a, unless you're very specific about not uh, of your inclusion exclusion criteria for your data, you can get quite a narrow idea of what that type of population is thinking. And this became very apparent to me when I did my focus group studies in my PhD, where I was asking um, a very simple question, how does food make you feel? How does um, your emotions, does it impact the way that you eat? And it was all food and mood stuff. And all of the participants that I had in the nine focus groups that I did with 50 participants were all students and staff from SEU who I had convenient sampled. And most of them were health focused because they were interested in my study because it was on food and mental health because they were health focused. So we didn't really get the rich lived experience of people who eat that standard Western ultra processed diet, which is what I really wanted to know. I got the opinions of all these wonderful people who were super health focused, kind of ate healthy and a lot of them had like were vegan or vegetarian, things like that. So you have to be very aware of the generalizability of your research. Um, qualitative research takes a long time. 
It takes a long time to collect the data, sitting down, having interviews with like 50 people for an hour will take 50 hours. Transcribing one hour of an interview can take up to four hours. So that's 50 hours times four, that's 200 hours of transcription. And that's before you even get to the data analysis. Then you have to code and theme all of those uh, transcripts. So it's quite a time consuming process, which is why I sometimes it's a bit tricky to do in an honest year in nine months, but you need time and you need time not just to work on the data analysis, but to move away from the analysis. So there's this thing in qualitative research where you want to be close to the data. You want to then move away from the data. Some of the best uh, ideas that I've ever had with my data has been when I've been on the massage table and unable to be actively working or driving in my car without the radio on or in the shower and where your brain is idle is when you have your best moments in qualitative research. So it's a very, it's all about thinking and being immersed in the data rather than with quant data, you're like working away, doing your analysis on in your program, but there's a big space in qualitative for really thinking and absorbing and immersing yourself. So that can take time as well, that moving away. Sometimes you want to take two or three weeks just to think about what the participant said and and what was in the um, audio recordings. So you, it really is time-consuming. And the analysis is, is more complex than quant data where you're not looking at the surface level, you're trying to look beneath what the participant said. Right. So here are the different types of qualitative research. We're going to move into these and talk about these in specifics in a moment. And I'm going to ask you in the chat box, as we go through each of these types of qualitative research, if you can type a research question that you think could be answered using each of these types of qualitative research. So while I explain them, have a, have a think and I'll give you time to type into the chat box some research questions that may be answered using these types of research. So first we've got our interpretive qualitative research. Interpretive research explores how people make meaning of a situation or an event. We collect data from interviews, focus groups, from observations, or from content that we can find in newspapers or on social media, or any words that are written in the public domain. When we do interpretive research, we analyze patterns or common themes in the data by transcribing that. The outcome that we get is a rich descriptive account of the people's experiences that makes reference to the literature that helped frame the study. So I'm gonna give you a few moments to provide an example of a research question that you think could be answered using interpretive qualitative research. Four, do political rallies influence voting behaviour? Excellent. That's good. So that one could be done in a couple of different ways. You could look at historical documents and look at 
political rallies that have happened in the future, in the past, sorry, and how that may have influenced the voting. What else do you think, Thor? What other ways could we analyse that data, do you think, or collect that data? Respectively, through interviews and then follow up. Yeah, good. So you could interview participants and ask them about their uh, voting behaviors and then see what happens after political rally. So before and after interviews, maybe. Should generative AI be used for teaching, like how calculators were introduced? Just a thought. And who do you think um, we would ask that to? What would our population be? Would we ask students? Would we ask teachers? Who would we ask? I think this is a really interesting topic because we were talking about this the other day. The introduction of even things like SPSS data analysis programming back in the day when everyone did statistical analysis by hand and using tables Academics used to say that was cheating, right? When Grammarly came out and did spelling and grammar checks for us, academics said that was cheating. And now we use these every day at uni. So is generative AI just another one of those things that is going to be integrated into learning in schools and universities? And one day we will look back and be like, well, everyone uses Gen AI. Why did... Why did the academics back then think that was cheating? It's very interesting. Employers as well. So industry, yeah, that's a great idea. Massim, does homestay during the lockdowns of COVID influence mental health? That's a really good one. How is psychological safety experienced by key stakeholders in elite sport? I also really love that one. Good, very good examples. How is interaction with the legal system experienced by Indigenous people? Yes, excellent. All very good interpretive uh, research. Now, phenomenological research is similar to interpretive but a little bit different. In phenomenological research, we explore individuals' lived experience of an event or a phenomenon. In phenomenological research, the most important part of this type of research is that the researcher attempts to acknowledge their own attitudes, biases, values, judgments, beliefs regarding the phenomenon and allowing the researcher to see the phenomenon specifically and intuitively from the perspective of the individual. So when we get to this reflexivity um, example or activity very shortly, you will see uh, that it is highly tied to phenomenological research where we're trying to acknowledge, not remove our biases, we're trying to acknowledge them and trying to see the phenomenon from the research, from the perspective of the individual experiencing it rather than from our own perspective or our own funnel of everything that we've ever experienced in our lives. So reflexive thematic analysis, which we'll get to in the last two slides by Braun and Clark, and that's all of their papers on it, is the best way to do phenomenological research. So can you provide an example of a research question that could be answered using phenomenological research? Keeping in mind, we still use focus groups, interviews, um, and observation.
Dorian, could it be something on how the pandemic was experienced? Yeah, absolutely. You definitely, definitely could look at, say, a focus group of participants and ask them about the pandemic. It might be cool to, like, uh, get groups of participants who experience the pandemic differently. You could get a group of Victorians who went through, like, full quarantine and really high, high levels of um, being of lockout or lock-in. And then you could also talk to Queenslanders who had like maybe two or three weeks of that. You could talk to uh, Western Australians. What did they experience? They were over there. Their whole state was cut off, but they didn't really have as much uh, quarantine as we had in, say, Victoria or New South Wales. That would be very, very cool. So that's definitely looking at the lived experience. But you would then be having to acknowledge all of your experiences during COVID and the pandemic and trying to see the phenomenon from that particular individual's experience rather than from your own. The lived experience of Indigenous young people in the youth detention system, that's excellent, yes. And removing the your preconceived ideas of what their experience is and trying to see it specifically from their perspective. Shari, exploring the experiences of groups who have experienced different types of trauma, like military service men and women. Very good, yep. Connectivity phenomenon between various ecosystems. And this is a great one. That's a very sciencey one, that's kind of cool. Something that is an experience of someone or a group of people whose experience is different to that of the researcher. Yeah. So neurotypical researcher looking at the lived experience of new neurodivergent individuals. Now, Bridget brings up a really good point here because in qualitative research, there's two different types of ways of doing research, insider research and outsider research. Insider research, in this particular example that Bridget has brought up, is, say, a neurodivergent researcher interviews or does a focus group with neurodivergent participants and looking at their lived experience. Outsider research is when a neurotypical researcher would be interviewing or doing a focus group with neurodivergent individuals. And both are as good as each other, but you will find that you may get different analyses and different outcomes out of your data from the two different types of researchers. At the moment, we are doing uh, here with at SCU, we are doing a interview study with uh, our Australian Defence Force veterans and their experiences with food and mental health. And both of the interviewers, both of the facilitators, myself and Jessica Bayes, are uh, outsider researchers because neither of us have uh, been in the military, but we live with people who have been. So we're kind of touched on the edges, but we're going to get specific training from our uh, ex-military uh, psychologist on our uh, interviewing technique just to make sure that everything is uh, correctly done in that space. Student accommodation experiences after the flood, that's really good. Perspective of early exits from schools on what could education system provide that would have meant something to them so that they could be around longer in the education system and emerge as contributors to society. Yeah, excellent. All perfect examples of phenomenological research. Let's talk about grounded theory. So grounded theory explores a theory that is grounded in the data. So before you go out with interpretive and phenomenological research, you'll have an idea of what you want to look at, but you find things from your observations. In grounded theory, it kind of starts with a theory first. And the method involves comparing data against one another until categories, properties, and hypotheses emerge that state relationships between these categories. The hypotheses are tentative and suggestive, not tested in the study. So it's a little closer to quant data than qual. But it's still big quality because we are looking at those experiences. But the theory 
has already kind of been um, uh, evolved in the literature. So what are some examples of a research question that could be answered using grounded theory? And while you're writing that, Rebecca has written one for Phenomenological, which is how the outcome of the referendum for an Indigenous voice to Parliament impacted Aboriginal Australians. Amazing example. Hi, Megan. Can I just ask a quick question? Hi. Yeah. <laughs> it's Bridget talking. Um, Hi. I'm just wondering, I don't know if I've missed it, but with grounded theory, does the theory already exist and you're testing it within your analysis of the data or are you developing the theory as a result of the data that you're analysing? Yeah, so the theory exists. So an e example of this is, say, like feminism theory. Um, if you're building a research project on feminism theory, you could be asking a question uh, around, and I think Braun and Clark use a really good example in their book, uh, Practical Guide to Reflexive Thematic Analysis, on women who choose to be child-free. And they did um, a heap of interviews with women who were choosing to be child-free and their experiences of that. And the whole um, analysis was built on this feminism theory and what it means to be child-free for women and um, how other people e interact with women who are child-free. And there's some really amazing um, things that have come out of that data. So you kind of know a little bit more about what you're going to find than the the purely exploratory stuff that you do with phenom phenomenology because it is grounded in the data already but you're asking a brand new question that is linked to that kind of already developed theory shari bridget did that answer your question sorry yeah i think so yeah <laughs> Okay, Shari, we did some brief grounded theory style research at Bond. Nice. On methods to increase sustainability on campus during COVID-19. Shari, can I ask you who taught you that? You can turn your mic on if you would like. Hello. Yes, you hey. It's a bit easier. Um, that was before I was in psych, when I was in the transformation programs um, with Robert. Yeah, cool. Wow, I'm so that's really cool. At the moment, the psychology degree at Bond, which I teach into, does we have like one week of qualitative research in the research methods unit and it's not taught anywhere else. So I'm now integrating qualitative into like the first year stats, the third year stats, the research methods program, the foundations units. So yeah, it's cool that it's being taught in other area in other areas of Bond because that will support my um, argument of putting it into the rest of the degree. Excellent. Definitely. Thank you. Good. And the grounded theory for what Shari was talking about, so increasing sustainability on campus. So sustainability theory is a, a big one, right? So we all know that it's important to care for the environment, things like that. Sustainability is a really big, important topic, and it's definitely got a theory backing it they would use that theory to set up their uh, data analysis for how to increase sustainability on campus. Very, very good. Case studies. So case studies are uh, qualitative research on a specific individual or unit. So it's on one person or one phenomenon. And it's usually about a phenomenon or a person that has had something extremely unique happen to them 
And they may be the only person or the only thing that this has ever happened to in the history of the world, potentially. And then we cluster the case studies of all of these unique individuals together to develop a narrative or a story about um, the, the theory that we are uh, interested in. Um, a really good example of this in psychology is Phineas Gage, who was a railway worker in a very long time ago and he had a steel rod shoot through his face and come out the back of his head and it went straight straight through his prefrontal cortex and it took out a whole chunk of his brain and he didn't die he stayed alive he recovered from his injury but something very very interesting happened to Phineas his personality completely changed because the chunk of brain that was removed by the steel rod passing through his head was the part of his brain that's responsible for personality. And he went from being a kind-hearted man to this gruff, aggressive, violent um, individual. He is the only person this has ever happened to and survived, and he became this amazing case study for this. Now, back in those days, you couldn't test personality by touching on bits of the brain with technology like we can now. So this was a major, major breakthrough in psychology. And he is a very, very good example of a case study. So can you provide another example of a research question that could be answered using a case study research? Extreme long COVID cases. That's an excellent one, Dorian. We're actually doing a survey on long COVID at the moment, and I probably should put some open-ended questions in there. What sort of questions do you think I should ask? Yeah, so people who have changed their gender or their, their sex. There's some documentaries on YouTube about these cases, yeah. Why Taylor Swift is so famous and popular compared to other artists. I love that one. Why? She's just got the perfect combination of everything somehow. Find that and package it. That's very good one. Right, critical research. Critical research critiques the social, cultural and psychological assumptions regarding present day context with the goal of empowering individuals and enabling change. It challenges current power distributions, the status quo, as opposed to merely revealing meaning. So this research is all about changing the minds, changing political influence, changing how the world sees people. Research questions address race, gender, class, power structures in particular, um, how certain groups are oppressed and how others are not, how truth and knowledge are constructed. So in today's day and age, qualitative research in critical, in critical research in particular has vastly changed the landscape of Australia and the rest of the world. Even back in the last DSM in the Diagnostic Statistics Manual, uh, of mental health disorders. So we're in the DSM-5 at the moment. The DSM-4, which wasn't it, was changed in the late 70s, I believe, still considered homosexuality as a mental health disorder and hysteria in women. So women were hysterical and her husband could send the, their wives to like psychologists and GPs saying that they were hysterical 
and that was considered to be a mental health disorder. So there's all these things that specifically in gender and race and class that are changing because of this critical research. So who can think of a good research question that could be answered using critical research specifically to address oppression and class differences and group differences and power structures and things like that. Great, Courtney. Toxic ideals of mental toughness in elite contact sport. Excellent. That is perfect. That's exactly what critical research is. Specifically in mental health, there's also a change in, particularly in professional sport, NRL I'm talking at the moment, where it hasn't been okay to talk about mental health and that's all changing at the moment. There's critical research happening there. Um, there's a podcast by Keegan Hipgrave who used to play for Parramatta and the Titans where he uh, interviews elite athletes and professional sports people about mental health and all of them speak about how there's this kind of idea that you don't talk about it in sport for some reason you just don't talk about negative mental health and you don't share sensitive information with your teammates and when you do and I know there's one uh interview with Nico Hines from the Sharks when he was in the Melbourne Storm, talking about how they sat down once a week and they talked about things that were um, sensitive to them, like who was missing their family and things like that, and it actually strengthened the team and they won the grand final that year. So uh, very, very cool. Um, inclusion, exclusion of neurodivergent children in mainstream school. Excellent. Yes. At a... S-E-A-N meeting this week, all the leaders present were men. Mm. There still is a little bit of that happening. I think they also just released the um, gender pay gap differences in Australia, which was very, very interesting. Why do female footballers suffer from ACL injuries in professional football? Okay, cool. Postmodern research. It challenges the forms and categories of traditional qualitative analysis. So everything that we've talked about, it then challenges. It involves questioning certainties and assumptions in the world, including what truth is, the ability of research and science to discover truth, and all generalizations and topologies. So it's basically saying, well, in qualitative research, do we really know what the participants experiences are or they just funneled through research perspective can we ever find the real truth what is the real truth can science ever discover truth we ask can the experience of another be captured or is it created by the researcher do the researcher actually in their analyses and in their um, write-ups actually just write what they believe can we ever remove that biases? Can any study, quantitative or qualitative, be viewed as valid if traditional methodologies are flawed? And I talked about those um, different types of um, problems in quantitative data analysis and that it's also subjective. Is it possible to institute any real change? So they ask all these tricky questions in postmodern research. Right. Before we go to a break, which we will do in a, about five minutes, I'm going to give you a reflexivity uh, activity that you can do. So we'll go for a break for five minutes and then I'll get you to do this reflexivity activity as well for five minutes. So we'll do a whole 10-minute break with your ability to go and have a cup of coffee, 
grab something to eat and then do the activity at the same time. So in my opinion, reflexivity is the most important part of qualitative research. And we've spoken about this a little bit all the way through this, how it's really important for the researcher to acknowledge their biases, their judgments, their beliefs, their assumptions, what they bring to the project, how everything that they've ever experienced in their lives could impact how you interact with participants, how you design the study, how you collect the data, when you're coding and theming, how you develop the themes, all of this can be influenced by everything you've ever experienced in your life. So we need to be always asking, am I accurately depicting the world given the ways I'm collecting and analysing my data? Am I truly giving the experience of the individual or am I funneling that through my lens? So good qualitative research is often the most rigorous and difficult research in this way. It involves the researcher reflecting on all of these, on how they are positioned in relation to the research, how they are positioned in the relation to the participants. Are you insider? Are you outsider? Have you experienced these things? Have you not? So a reflexive journal should be kept from the very beginning to the very end of every research that you publish in qualitative research. And in this reflexive journal, you will note uh, elements of your gender. How does your gender influence your belief systems about this project? Uh, acknowledge your social privilege or your lack of social privilege and how this could impact the analysis for all the way from research design to reporting. Um, your sexuality, your race, your age, your immigration status, your beliefs about gender, your beliefs about queer theory, your beliefs about feminism and abortion and racism. What about white male privilege? Your beliefs about white male privilege, how you are positioned in that way to your research. What do you believe about Indigenous and disability rights? What do you believe about politics and your political leanings? What do you believe about the sex industry and people who work in the sex industry? What do you believe about euthanasia? All these types of things. And then you move into what do I believe about this topic? I do research in vegan and vegetarian populations and their mental health. I eat a plant predominant diet. I don't exclude meat. So I eat lots of plants, but I also eat meat because I believe food is medicine and I think that eating little bits of meat is important. So when I do my interviews with my vegan and vegetarian um, participants in particular, at the moment we're interviewing vegan men. I'm not a man. I'm also not vegan but I kind of eat in a similar pattern in some ways, but I know nothing about what it's like to be a man. I know nothing about the social identity of men. I know nothing about the motivations to become vegan. I know nothing about that apart from what I know from the literature. So I need to then think, well, what do I believe about vegans? What do I believe about men? What do I believe about what it is to be a man from a women's perspective? So I need to think about all of those things. Are there any pre-presumptions or presuppositions that I bring to this about these people that I'm um, going to be interviewing? So what I'm going to get you to do is I'm going to get you to do a reflexivity exercise. And for five minutes, I want you to think about, and I'm not going to ask you to share because reflexivity is a very personal activity and it should never be shared with anyone. Because just the idea that you will have to share it or put it in an appendices or share it with your supervisor will mean that you won't do the exercise to its full capacity. So if anyone ever asks you to share your reflexive journal, tell them, no, I will not, because it will impact the results. So for the next five minutes, I want you to think about how you are positioned in relation to your research. Write down your beliefs your morals, your opinions, and your perspectives on the participants and on the topic in general, and how this could influence your research design, your data collection, your interaction with participants, the data analysis, and writing up your report. And we will be back. You can also go have a cup of coffee if you like. And we will come back at, what's the time now? It is 11.35. We'll come back at 
11.45 and I'm not going to ask you to share because that's the whole point of the reflexive exercise, but please do it. And if any of you are interested in doing this um, properly for your research, um, I can, I'll give Alison, if you're still there somewhere, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll yeah. give you the Braun and Clark reflexive exercise um, handout. Okay. Yeah. That steps you through reflexivity for qualitative research projects and you can go from the very beginning, answer all their questions, that sort of stuff. Okay. So remind me. <laughs> all right. I'll pass it on to everyone. Yeah. With the PowerPoint. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, great. Okay, all right. Thanks. I'll see you back here at quarter two. All right. Nice.
Okay, I'm back. How's everyone going? Just give me a thumbs up if you are back. Um, I'd like to make a quick comment if if yeah. that's okay. We've got time. It's very interesting to hear that. Um, you know, reflective journal is uh not to be shared. I guess. Um, so when I did my thesis a few years ago now, um, it was uh about a family member. So very much. I declare my biases as an insider of a family and everything. And I was asked to write a research journal or, or, or more, yeah, more about like mapping my progress through and how I felt about certain discoveries and things. Yep. And it got published in the back of the thesis as an appendices. And I'm pleased to hear that that doesn't necessarily happen anymore because Looking it back, shouldn't have it, happened back then either. I'm sorry. I that wish to I you. wouldn't have, you know, because it's a public document now, and, and and there's been no, um, you know, negative feedback or anything. But it was such a personal journey that you know I wished I would have just kept it for myself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You would have disclosed personal feelings and personal things that happened to you, and, and then, that's not for public. I. I know. Knowledge. I don't know what my supervisors were thinking, but, you know, it was about 10 years ago. So, obviously, um, ideas have, have moved on, yeah, which I'm pleased Maybe, about. but still even back then, like, it, and if you think about it, if you knew that they were going to make you publish it with your thesis, you wouldn't write things in it, right? You wouldn't acknowledge or share certain things maybe. Well, it would stop you from doing true. stuff. That's true. And, and then, the, yeah. One of the examiners started making comments on it. <gasps> and oh. so we, we had to sort of argue that those, they, you know, in, in terms of changes, that those changes should not be made. <laughs> oh. Anyway, that's, that's <sighs> it's all good. I'm all good. Thank you for sharing, Alison. <laughs> and that is a really good example of why reflexivity yeah. should always be a personal thing and always Absolutely. if anyone ever has their supervisor say that they have to publish it get them to message me email me yeah. I'll come and help you <laughs> yeah, yeah so thank you Alison so okay. much is everyone back I don't know is it just you and me Alison I've got one thumbs up. Oh, yeah, people are back. Okay, cool, cool. Right here, I'm back. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, I said I wasn't going to get you to share your reflexivity journal, so I will not ask that, but I hope that it was an activity that you enjoyed. And um, as I said, I will give Alison the full reflexivity exercise from Broad and Clark's book, Um that I do every time I start a new qualitative project. I just like thinking about like where I've come from, everything that's happened to me in my life, how does it make me think about certain things and my belief systems? And I check back in with my original reflexive journal that I started with at the beginning of my PhD and it kind of reminds me of things that I'd forgotten about that I believed in back before I was an academic and like how things have changed and my beliefs about research and how that's changed. So, um, yeah, it should be something that you constantly work on across your whole research project and continue to reflect on and go back to um, when you do your interviews and things or your focus groups or your observations of people, you will also go back in and like talk about how those conversations made you feel and what was surprising to you and things like that, just so that um, you you can main, manage that, um, like manage your um, research degrees of freedom so that you're not just going and writing all the things about you, basically, <laughs> which is quite easy to do. Right. So let's talk about the methods of data collection now. So when should we use qualitative methods? When variables cannot be quantifiable, so when you can't use uh, data analysis or statistics to answer a question, 
when variables are best understood in their natural settings, when they need to be studied over a real time period or within the present moment, um, when studying intimate details of roles, processes and groups, and when the paramount objective is understanding. To do qualitative methods, we must have a requisite knowledge and skills about the methodology. So it's unwise to dive into qualitative methods without first kind of knowing a bit about how they're different, what the methods are, reading Braun and Clark, reading up on qualitative research methods. Of course, you can do qualitative methods without having done them before, but maybe in a supervision sort of style before you do it on your own. Um, you must have knowledge about the methodology, the setting, and the nature of the issue. So you also need to go to the literature, read widely about the topic that you're interested in, know the background behind your participants and their experiences before you talk to them. You must be familiar with your own biases, your assumptions, your expectations of what you're going to find, and your value systems. You must be empathic, intelligent, energetic, and interested in listening. If you're very bad at active listening, qualitative research methods may not be for you. You need to listen and you also need to be able to identify the things that people say underneath the things that people say. That's the hardest part of qualitative analysis. You must be open to embracing multiple realities and truths and the way that we know the world. Is what we are, what we know real? We must be prepared to produce detailed, comprehensive, and sometimes extremely lengthy data analysis and reporting. So be prepared for the hard work. There's a lot of work in qualitative research. Qualitative research quickly exhausts resources and time. Very much so. Therefore, it is ideal to limit the amount of data collected. So. When people say small sample size is a limitation of qualitative research, that is not true. You can get as good data out of four or five people as you can get out of 50 people. Knowing when you have the right amount of data is the tricky part. And we're moving away from this idea of data saturation, which, which means that every time you do an interview or a focus group or an observation, you, you stop seeing new information. So we're moving away from that and moving towards more detailed, rich, lived data. It's not the size of the qualitative um, sample that matters. It's what you do with the data and what you see in the data. You need to be very clear about your research focus. So your research aim is very important. We do not hypothesize in qualitative research. And we don't usually ask research questions. We have an aim, which is quite exploratory. And as Anthony said before, wishy-washy, we don't really like to use that word so much, but you've got an idea of what you want to find and your research aim should be broad and allow for things that you're not expecting. So you write down your foggy ideas. You can get a bit more specific towards your research aim. You want to concentrate on what's the most important part of that aim, though, and not the irrelevant, non-important elements. And start writing some specific questions that you want answered. And these will turn into your like semi-structured interview uh, structure. So here are the different qualitative methods that we have. We've got our interviews, our focus groups, ethnography, autoethnography and content analysis. And I will go through these in detail. Again, with each of these qualitative methods, I want you to think of a good research question that could be used to using these methods. So interviews. Interviews are a conversation on a given topic between a respondent and an interviewer. They're always one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes face-to-face, -face, sometimes online. We use interviews to obtain detailed insights and personal thoughts into a topic that the participants may not feel comfortable sharing in a group setting. If the topic is about a uh, about something that the participants might get a better um, 
raft of data from having a conversation style, we would use a focus group. Interviews are usually flexible and unstructured. Sometimes you'll have one overarching kind of question that you're going to ask and some prompts in case your participant stops talking. But we usually use like a semi-structured interview guide where we've got suggested questions that we will ask throughout the interview. But you can move away from those questions or you can stick to them. You can be guided by the answers of the participant throughout the interview. And you don't really read them like an interview style, like one after the other, waiting for the participant to answer each question. It should be more free flowing. And sometimes you have to be very careful not to repeat a question that the participant has already answered in another question. So you have to be kind of very good at active listening and um, thinking about the questions that are in your interview guide and making sure that it feels like a natural conversation rather than a, a question answer style. The purpose of interviews is to probe informants or participants' motivations, feelings, and beliefs. Interviews are usually go for about an hour depending on the participant. Sometimes they go for much shorter because it's some participants, it's like getting blood out of a stone. But you don't get upset or annoyed. You just move on to your next participant. Um, the interviewer needs to cre create rapport. So you need to learn about rapport building in the beginning of an interview before you move on to questioning a participant. Because if you don't have rapport with someone and they don't trust you and they don't feel like you're similar to them, they're not going to open up and they're not going to give you the rich data that you need. So it needs to be in a relaxed, open environment. They need to feel like they can share. Um, the wording of the questions are determined by the flow of the conversation. Sometimes your semi-structured interview guide will move all over the place. Questions from the bottom can get moved up. Um, if you know your questions well enough, you probably don't even need the document with you. Um, interview transcripts. So what a transcript is, is you always audio record your interview on two devices in case one breaks down or one's in the part of a room where you can't really hear. Um, a transcript is where you take the audio and you write verbatim every single thing that the participant and the facilitator said. So the interview transcripts are then analysed for codes and themes and connections in the interview data. Can you provide an example of a research question that could be answered using an interview rather than a focus group? I just tripped over the dog. So interview rather than a focus group, what would be a topic that would be better one-on-one, -on -one, face to face than in a say a conversational style of eight to 12 people? Courtney is saying when you don't want others influencing or coming to a consensus on an experience. Yeah, that's exactly right. So if it's a sensitive topic or if you feel like groupthink might happen where all the participants will agree with whoever has the strongest voice, an interview is a better idea. Thor, please share the rationale behind your decision to become a teacher. That's a really good one. And exactly Thor's question is actually a very good um, example of what Courtney says about not wanting others to influence your your uh, the participants' answers. If you asked a group of teachers together what their rationale behind their decision to become a teacher, they might, um, other teachers' answers might influence their answer. It's something that we called um, in qualitative research, we have this thing called competitive rank in focus groups. So when you go into a focus group and you sit down, you unconsciously look at every single person in the group and you rank the order of the people in the group from the most authoritative to the least authoritative. And you put yourself in that rank somewhere without even consciously knowing that you're doing it. 
And they have people who are of an authoritative rank above you or your perception that they are above you say something that can highly influence your answers in in the conversation or your agreement to a topic. It's very, very interesting. Um, experience with police after a traumatic event. Yeah, that's a great one because you wouldn't want to maybe some people wouldn't want to talk about that in, in a conversation with eight people. They might not definitely not want to talk about their traumatic experience or how the police, um, their experience with what the police did during that traumatic event. That's excellent. In interview transcription, how do you attempt to gather the non-verbal communication elements? If you're writing during the interview, this could damage the interview experience. Yeah, so that's a really good point, David. I highly recommend when you are interviewing to be constantly engaged in the conversation. Don't write anything down. The audio will capture things, but it's then up to you potentially when writing the transcription to write those nonverbal elements in so it can be quite difficult. Or writing notes directly after the interview, but we never write while the participant is speaking to us ever it changes the answers that they will give you and their belief about how interested you are in them um, so you also need to be managing your own nonverbal communication your eye contact your mirroring of the position that the participants in and learning all those rapport building skills so that's a very good question so let's talk about focus groups oh just wait before that advantages of interviews Freer exchange than focus groups. Sometimes you can probe more complex motivations and behaviours. Um, it's easier to attach a particular response to respondents. So in focus groups, sometimes coming back to David's question about how do you gather the nonverbal elements, in focus groups it's even more tricky because you've got eight to nine voices and sometimes they talk over each other and it's very difficult sometimes to attach a particular response to a specific respondent. Although, when you use artificial intelligence to transcribe your interviews now or your focus groups, it can um, identify different voices much better than a person can. So it's quite useful. Um, interviews are good to use when a topic is sensitive and participants may not share in a group setting. But the disadvantages are that you need to be a qualified facilitator to do an interview usually. But we all learn that in our and when we're doing it in our thesis, so we're supported in that. Um, facilitators can be expensive. Um, the length and expense of interviews often leads to very small sample sizes, particularly if your interviews are across this wide, large country and you have to travel in aeroplanes, etc. Um, transcribing is time intensive, usually four hours for a one-hour transcription of uh, audio. Sorry. There's subjectivity and fuzziness and there is the element of social desirability bias, which means that the interviewer, interviewees may want to put their best foot forward and may answer questions so that the interviewer will like them rather than in an honest fashion. That happens in surveys as well. Right, focus groups. Are a loosely structured interview conducted by a trained facilitator among a small number of participants simultaneously? Um, usually six to eight members is the perfect amount of participants. Um, we normally give incentives and refreshments for focus groups. So uh, we give Coles Myers vouchers for participation and we also provide coffee, tea and cheese and biscuits, fruit. Um, because my research is in uh, nutrition and mental health, I try to keep it healthy, but you don't have to. You can do cakes and pastries if you like. Um, it in, um, influences a conversational style between participants. So that's when you want participants to be bouncing backwards and forwards off each other and having a talk between themselves. And the facilitator should say very little. In fact, the focus groups that I did in my PhD on food and mood, I said one sentence about what the topic was about and my participants spoke for 60 to 90 minutes to each other. When they got off track away from my research aim, 
I'd bring them back in and ask them a question that brought them back on track. But apart from that, I said nothing, very little. So the facilitator should say the least. Um, usually 60 to 90 minutes for a focus group. Can we think of a research question? Whoops, I'm going too far. A research question that is suited to focus group research rather than interview style research. So when, what's a topic when a conversation style would be more appropriate than a one-on-one -on -one backwards and forwards type interview? How to avoid answers being influenced by other, how do you avoid answers being influenced by other respondents? You just have to acknowledge that that, happening put it into your reflexivity journal and the facilitator should always be aware of people who are taking over conversation and people who are not saying much and addressing when say someone is dominating the conversation and they've finished speaking you would turn to someone who doesn't speak as much and say Cindy what do you think about that? So always being actively listening and aware of the dynamics that are happening in the group. If you see group think happening and you identify that people are just agreeing with a dominant personality, that is the facilitator's role in changing up the track of the, of the conversation and moving in and um directing conversation towards uh, quieter participants or asking if people have a different opinion or framing a, a different way. Have we got any other research questions that might be suitable for this type of research for focus groups? I can give you an example of what we're doing at the moment. So at the moment, we're asking students their beliefs about how student feedback surveys influence academics' mental health. And the reason that we're asking them in a focus group style is because we want a conversation between the students about what they experience when they do student feedback surveys, how uh, whether or not they've done non-constructive feedback, how they think that academics um, respond to the feedback. Do we listen to them? Do we change the teaching units? Do we change teaching performance? All those types of things. And we want that very conversational style so that the students can talk about their experiences and others' experiences in the group. One, the effect of students' belief or religion on students' learning. That's a really good one. That's an interesting one too. Would you have students in your focus group of different religions or of same religion? Well, Juan answers my question. Rebecca, exploring Aboriginal students' experiences of cultural safety in tertiary education. And that would be a really good one. And usually when we do Indigenous um, qualitative research, we do our focus groups more like a yarning circle and so we would always have a indigenous facilitator and we would when we are developing our research design we would always have a indigenous advisor advising on the research design the facilitation the questions when we're developing the questions they're culturally appropriate and then the focus group is facilitated by the Indigenous um, research member as well. So very, very important for to be doing things the correct way. Juan would do a focus group with students from the same religion. 
I wonder if you'd get different things with different religions. Right. So the advantages of focus groups is that you would get a richer data from conversation rather than question and answer style like in an interview. Um, you can study specific populations, like Juan said, put all of one religion, uh, people of one religion into a focus group and find out their experiences. Um, it's easy, easily understandable. Flexibility in covering more complex topics. Uh, it may and does uncover unanticipated ideas that are important. We found out so much cool stuff in the student feedback survey focus groups that students actually thought the same thing as the academics that we surveyed in the survey that I talked about with the open-ended questions. They actually thought their, th their beliefs aligned with what the academics' beliefs were. So the whole key take-home message of that study was academics feel this way, students feel this way, so universities need to start listening to the students and the staff. Usually focus groups are a great first exploratory step before you construct a survey and it gives flesh and connectedness to real people in the way that they communicate. The group synergy is like you get such amazing data out of a out of a group conversation it's just so different and one 90 minute focus group is much faster to to transcribe than eight hours of interviews so if you've got eight participants with eight hours of interviews that turns into 32 hours of transcription rather than 90 minute focus group and maybe four hours five hours of transcription Anthony, I conducted the focus groups with consumers with a lived experience, peer worker to ensure a consumer focus. Excellent. Savaha, stringent entry requirements for language proficiency for migrants who have been in the English speaking country for a significant amount of time. Alison, the example from before that I gave, women who choose to be child free. That's an interesting one because that's a sensitive topic, right? Would interviews be better or would focus groups be better for that one? That it, And that will really depend on what sort of data you want to get out of it. Yeah. And what I commonly do, especially in the body image and the postpartum interviews that we've, we've been doing, we actually did interviews and focus groups yeah. and we're currently in the stage of analysing both and seeing if we got different stuff out of the two different methods so that would be a cool thing to do yeah thanks Alison disadvantages of focus group research there you go that lack of generalizability small sample size although I disagree that this is actually a limitation of qualitative research so um, again social desirability bias and that problem with competitive rank where we unconsciously rank ourselves compared to the other participants. It's super subject to research or interpretation. So, again, that reflexivity journal is super important. After every single focus group you conduct, you need to check in on your reflexivity, check in on your biases and your assumptions, how you felt about what was said and that you don't take what was said in that focus group into the next one and influence the next participants. Cost per respondent is high compared to surveys, same with interviews. Um, the results are dependent on the skill of the moderator in running the group and interpreting the data. We have a very good ex example of this in the vegan men interviews. I did six interviews and we had students in the grad dip do 20 interviews across between them. And the quality of some of the ones that the students did were they're not usable because it was so very shallow surface level answers, 15 minutes, they were in and out. And sometimes I feel like that that may be not respecting the participants' time and then go against the whole NHMRC research mm -hmm. ethics. So just the difference in the quality of the facilitator is important. Um. Some disadvantages of focus groups is that the participant may be feeling a certain way on the day and that way may change the next day or the day before. So you're only ever getting their feelings and their response and their experiences of them in that very moment. 
Um, strong personalities are a hazard. People take over conversations. Some people don't speak a lot. The facilitator really needs to manage that. And then you've got that problem with groupthink where everyone will think the same thing. Right, ethnography. Ethnography is observing people. So we don't even talk to people. In ethnography, the researcher is in the background, doesn't interact with the participants, is observing people, cultures, customs, or habits. It's more common in anthropology and psychology, uh, studying human society and culture, so you immerse yourself in the culture. Um, it uses a sociocultural lens through which the data is interpreted, interpreted, sorry, um, usually extensive field work and it usually takes a lot of time because in ethnography, sometimes the researcher will become part of the culture first before observing the culture from inside. So a good example of this is uh, an example of a researcher who wants to do an ethnography on the influence of the bikey gangs in some ways and then becomes a member of the bikey gang, gets integrated into the culture, goes and sells drugs, takes drugs, becomes fully immersed in the culture and then starts to do the research from within. That's a really good example. Um, another example of an actual research project that was done uh, a couple of years ago now uh, for her PhD one of the girls decided to explore the drinking culture of AFL fans. And so her role was to become a fan, an AFL fan, and she went to a certain match every week in her PhD and drank with the crowd alcohol, but drank in different ways. So um, she would be immersed with the heavy drinkers, then she would be immersed with the non-drinkers, and then she'd be immersed with the designated drivers, then she would be immersed with the light drinkers. And taking notes each week and then wrote up a big PhD on the different drinking cultures in AFL. Very cool. <laughs> Very immersed within the culture, right? So can you provide me an, an example of a research question that could be answered using ethnography? What sort of research questions could we answer using ethnography? I've just given two. People who live on fast food and then document their journey. That would be an autoethnography, which we are going to look into in the next slide, but good. So observations of your own fast food experience. Community charity support say, be different ethnic or religious groups. Yeah, so if you were a researcher that wanted to look into um, community charities, you could become a community charity volunteer, get immersed in the culture, and then start your research in observe, observing from the inside, or you could do it from the outside as well. Ethnography can be done external, so you don't have to become part of the culture sometimes to observe. Any other research questions that could be answered using ethnography. While you're thinking, I will move on to autoethnography. So autoethnography is similar, but it's an autobiography of the researcher. So the researcher is observing their own lived experience and then they connect their personal experience 
to cultural, political and social meaning. It uses deep and careful self-reflection, so reflexivity, reflexivity is even more important in autoethnography, strives for social justice and making the world a better place. So it's not just, oh, I did this cool thing, I want to write about it in research. It's I experienced this and I want to change the way the world works because of my experience. So it's more of that critical research Um it's a rich description of the lived experience, usually from a marginalised research individual. And I can give you a really good example of this, and I want you to start thinking of your own, of a PhD student who was in the SCPA, who graduated just before me, who did an autoethnography. They experienced the symptoms of uh, autism spectrum disorder. And they did their thesis on the experience, their experience with ASD in employment. And it was an autoethnography that went from the beginning of their employed life up to when they submitted their thesis. And this person would have been in their 60s. So it was a wide range of employments and their experience as someone with ASD, how they were impacted by their employees, by their employers, and the different things that could have been put into place to help them integrate into their employment. And then it finishes with one employer that implemented these excellent things for them and they ended up being with this employer for a very long period of time. Um, and then it reflected on the cultural, political and social meaning of what it is to be to experience the symptoms of ASD and be employed or not be employed or have trouble getting employment and what employee employers can do to help people with ASD integrate into employment. Savaha, there, there is this photo photographer who takes photos of different ethnic groups in their own place. He pitches a tent outside the village and lives there until he in, is invited by the group and then he takes his photographs. Yeah, so that is, if he was a researcher, that would be a ethnography. Can anyone give me an example of an autoethnography, a research question that could be answered using autoethnography? I guess it always starts with my experience of. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And whatever that, yeah, teaching could, foreign culture or ooh. whatever, yeah. And could that change the literature? Could that change the cultural, political and social um, literature in the world? Could we make social change? Courtney, my experience of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Yeah, absolutely. I was turned down for an executive job in a motor dealership group because I was female. Yes, that's critical research. Definitely. The trying to get a job in a male dominant like industry, definitely. And then you could use that experience to talk about how to change the cultural and political landscape. Good. Advantages of ethnography. It can provide rich lived experience that no other research method could ever provide. Observing what people actually do in their, like, element, in their natural environments. Ability to research groups and cultures that have never been researched before. So a really good example of this is the Hadza group who live in Africa. There's two groups left, the Hadza and the Maasai, who have never it's been exposed to ultra processed foods in the Western dietary pattern. There are only two left in the world. They are an amazing population that we can go and research because there is no one else who hasn't ever eaten the Western dietary pattern. So we can look at them and say their mental health and the differences between their mental health and the Western population. And there's an ability to understand marginalized groups. Some disadvantages of ethnography, you're highly reliant on your own interpretation of other people's um, experiences. Again, reflexivity is really important. 
it can take years, if not lifetimes, to do this type of research. So it's very time intensive. And in some cases it can be dangerous or the researcher can get arrested or you can call into question your confidentiality and your ethical practices. So the ex ex example that I gave before about the, the drug the drug taking and being immersed in the bikey culture, you could do something illegal and end up in jail or you could be called out by the police to inform on someone who is in the drug ring and then that would go against your research ethics. So you'd have to balance your research ethics with your legal requirements. So it can be super dangerous. You could get shot. You could get end up in a bikey shootout or something and get killed. It's super dangerous in some cases. So um, the risk to the researcher needs to be weighed up as well. And just really quickly, narrative and content analysis involves the use of stories or life narratives, first-person accounts or experiences. Um, the stories are used as data, taking the perspective of the storyteller as opposed to the largest society. Um, a really good example of this is using social media. And because Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all these places make you like sign an agreement when you sign up that everything that you put on there is public knowledge, researchers can actually use it without having to get ethics to access it. So anything that's on social media, we can content analyze, have a look at what's happening in these forums and seeing like what people's actual opinions are of things. And this removes the whole social desirability bias thing that happens in focus groups and interviews when you ask a question they want to please the researcher because people are raw and real and sometimes cruel and trolly on the internet and are almost their real selves so much so than any other way of um, collecting data. So uh, Braun and Clark did this in their child free, the women who choose to be child free um, research. They went online and they um analyzed all hashtags that were hashtag child free and looked at what people said and they got two different sets of data, people who were child free or women who were child free and then people who were like talking about women who were child free, so women or people with children, and analyzed the opinions and the perceptions of both groups. So can you provide a research question that could be answered using content analysis? Rebecca is saying an, an autoethnography would be my experiences of racism as an Aboriginal woman within a specific context. That would be an amazing thesis. Amazing. I'd love to see an autoethnography on that. So much. Now, I, I feel like we're running out of time a little bit, so I might move on and just describe some of the advantages of content analysis. It's useful for gathering information not commonly accessed by other research methods. So books, historical records, drawings, diaries, anything that's written down in the public domain can be used. It's really cost effective and time effective because you're not having to do the interviews yourself, transcribe the interviews. It's all there. It's all ready. It's all publicly accessible. Um, it's the best way to access individuals' unfiltered experiences and beliefs and comparing things in the present and the past, but some disadvantages are it can be time consuming if there's a lot of content on social media. Um, it's susceptible again to researcher bias and interpretation. We're unable to control the dialogue because the um, content is just put out there so we can't ask the question and, and tailor it to our research question. Um, information can be lost or tampered with over time. Um, and it might miss the initial context that produced the text. So, and this is a good example, like if there's a Twitter feed and someone says something and then heaps of people react to it and then maybe the first thing that was said gets lost somewhere and then all you've got is the answers, you don't have that original context to go back to um, that produced those angry responses. 
so these are the different ways of analyzing poly research. And as I said um, at the beginning of the workshop, if you would like a more in-depth workshop or you feel it would be beneficial to do something on analyzing qualitative research, I can also do that. If that if if you feel that way, just ask Alison. If not, that's okay too. Um, but we've got content analysis that we briefly just mentioned. We've got discourse analysis, which is looking at sentences and grammar and the different ways that people speak rather than what they said, which is kind of cool. You've got that grounded theory that we talked about. And then the key thing or the most commonly used analysis in the whole of qualitative research is reflective them them thematic analysis. Um, basically coding themes and labels out of all of these different methods that we've just talked about. It focuses on reflexivity. And if you want, I will do a whole workshop on the six stages of thematic analysis, which is familiar, familiarize yourself with the data. There's a coding phase. Then you create themes, you review them, then you define them, you write your analysis, and then you go back and the process continues. Lots of yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have to do it all. I could change one of the advanced statistics ones into qualitative analysis if you want. Okay. Because there's two advanced, I'm doing two advanced statistics ones. We could change one of the advanced statistics ones into a qualitative data analysis. Okay, workshop. sounds good. Yeah. Up to you, whatever you would like. All right. And thank you, everybody. I Right on time. Well, kind of two minutes over. Fantastic. <laughs> really, really good. Yeah, excellent. And feel free to email me if you have any questions about qualitative research. Follow me on the socials if you like. I'm quite entertaining, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, Megan. I'll, I'll stop recording there. Excellent. Thank you, Alison.